We've got before us this evening a very interesting class I'd like to give. Uh, that will take us right through, as we saw there, to the choosing of a replacement for Judas before we get into Acts chapter 2. But to start with, in, in uh, verse 13 there of that first chapter, we're told that they came into an upper room. The Greek word has got the upper room. Now, we can't be definite about this, but most likely it was the same room that was used for the memorial feast and possibly that was the home of Mark's mother. You remember the incident in Acts chapter 12 when Peter was released from prison. He came and he knocked at the gate and, and the brethren were all congregated together praying in Mark's mother's house. So it was big enough for a congregation to get together and, uh, and meet for special occasions. So it must be in a big house. Now, possibly that's where the upper room was. But here the, the 11 were waiting for the promise from the father. Now, there were also women, as we saw there in the, the verse uh, 14, it says, and with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus and his brethren. Now, that's, that's a wonderful statement because prior, this is all mentions of his brethren before this. They, they thought that the Lord Jesus Christ, the half brother, that he was mad and they, they wouldn't go with him. But now the Lord has, has risen from the dead. Something's happened. They've been convinced. And so now his brethren are there with Mary and they're, they're waiting and they're throwing all their weight into the truth. It's, it's a little bit of an encouragement for us who have got family who maybe haven't done the right thing. And it, it could be at the very last minute, some of them may come to their senses as, as the, his brethren did here. But here's this wonderful statement. It tells us that he was there with that they were waiting there and the brethren, his brethren, were there waiting also for the promise from the Father. Now, I've got a picture here of, now that's not obviously the upper room, but it's it's ancient room. Maybe it was something like that. That looks like a, a, a stone building with a mud rendered wall or some or a plaster rendered wall and some sort of a thatched roof. But it would have, say, it would have been an old room, but it was large enough to accommodate 120 people now the greek has got the upper room and you can see the greek word there and i'm not an expert in greek at all but it's just interesting it's called hooper rune or hyper rune so it's a it's the upper room now thais says that it's a room in the upper part of a house sometimes built upon the flat roof of the house where the orientals were want to retire in order to sup meditate and pray. So it seems that these sorts of rooms were built up on the, the top floor and in the case where they congregated when Eutychus, Eutychus fell out of the window, it was on the third floor. So it would be large enough to accommodate 120 persons, make it around the size of, of well, Wilson Ecclesial Hall anyhow. So big enough, uh, quite a large room in this upper room. Now it tells us that there in, um, in that verse, 14 that there and i'll come back to all their names a little bit later the 11 but it says that verse 14 these all continued with one accord that means that they were all totally in agreement they were one mind one passion now it's a, a significant phrase used in this opening chapter they were there in one accord and, and that that unity flows on through the rest of acts there was unity of prayer, unity of worship. There was unity in gatherings and in fellowship. There was unity in praise. There was unity in witnessing. There was unity in obedience to the faith and determination. So they were all of one accord. Now, the word is practically a monopoly in Acts. By that we mean it's very rarely used in any other of the New Testament epistles or, or gospel accounts. It's found 11 times here and only once in Romans, and it denotes the fullness of the wholehearted cooperation in the things of God, or it can also mean a, a complete uncompromising resistance to the will of God. But most of the time, it relates to complete cooperation in the things of God. So it's true fellowship, it's true unity, and we're working together. That was the spirit of the first century ecclesia when it started. When we get to Acts chapter 5, Things change, of course, with Ananias and Sapphira. But up to this stage, they were all in unity. And so Peter stands up and he says, look, the, the reason 
while we've congregated together, it says that Peter stood up in the midst of them. So now Peter enters the second stage of his development. He's moving from the impetuous disciple of former days now to a bold and fearless leader. Now, not in any way that the Catholic Church would paint Peter. They said, you know, obviously he becomes the Pope. That's what they say. Nothing like that. But Peter does come to the fore. He now understands the importance of sacrifice and the need to feed the lambs. He, he would hark back to that time that the Lord had said to him, if you love me, Peter, feed my sheep, feed my lambs. And so Peter now sees the responsibility and he, he steps up to that responsibility and he calls the community to action. And there would have been much heart searching and confession during those days for all had forsaken the Lord in his hour of need. You know, they, they all, none of them were there at the, at the cross. There was only John and Mary. The rest had gone. They'd forsaken the Lord. But now things were different. The resurrection had occurred, and here they were, the 11, with around 120 in that room waiting. Now it says there in verse 15, and in those days Peter stood up in the midst of the brethren and said, and then we've got a, a statement in parenthesis, the number of the names together was about 120. When it uses that expression, the number of the names, it, it suggests that there was a formal list that had been prepared as there was under Moses. Quotation there I've got from Numbers. It says, Take ye the sum of all the congregation of Israel after their families by the house of their fathers with the number of their names, every male by their poles. So the book of Numbers, Israel was numbered in the same sort of language as used here. It was the number, there seems to be a role of some sort. Now, here in Acts, we've got a new Israel gathered together at the beginning of their wilderness wanderings. Numbers was all Israel gathered together at the beginning of their wilderness wanderings. But now here in Acts, we've got the new Israel of God. They've been called together. 120 were numbered. Now, in fact, there were many, many more. The number of believers was not limited to 120. It tells us in 1 Corinthians that the Lord had appeared and been seen uh, above 500 all at once. So it must have been a very large congregation. The Lord appeared and 500 people all at once saw him after his resurrection. But now here there's 120, maybe some of those 500, they're waiting in that room. It's interesting too that 120 persons were required to form a Jewish council in any town. Now it's just a suggestion that he was a council of brethren meeting to arrange for one to take the place of Judas. So if you like, it's a meeting of the arranging brethren of the elders, which included the 11, but 120 all told, to decide who would be the one now to take the place of Judas. Now, the only other place we've got a mention of 120 in scripture is in Second Chronicles chapter 5 and verse 12. It's the it's the number of the sounding of the priests. Now that's significant. I think I've got, I'd like you to come with me to that passage in Second Chronicles chapter 5, please. Second Chronicles chapter 5. And, and we'll just pick it up, yeah, well, from verse 12, like I've got it on the screen there. Also the Levites. Now, this is the, the opening of the temple under Solomon. Verse 12, Second Chronicles 5. Also the Levites, which were the singers, all of them of Asaph, of Heman, and of Judathan, with their sons and their brethren, being arrayed in white linen, having cymbals and psalteries and harps, stood at the east end of the altar, and with them, and 120 priests sounding with trumpets. So you've got 120 priests now at the, the great uh, consecration of the opening of the temple. Verse 13, and it came to pass that as the trumpeters, here's 120 trumpeters, and singers were, were as one as the brethren were, to make one sound to be heard in praising and thanking Yahweh, and when they lifted up their voice with the trumpets and cymbals and instruments of music and praised Yahweh saying, for he is good, for his mercy endureth forever. 
that the house was filled with a cloud, even the house of Yahweh. So great was the cloud, it tells us, that the priests could not stand to minister by reason of the cloud, for the glory of Yahweh had filled the house. So the glory of Yahweh had filled that house and it, in fact, excluded them. They couldn't continue. It excluded them. Now we connect that thought of the sounding of the priests with this cloud, firstly. It says the cloud that filled the house was the nimbus or the thunder cloud. And we've mentioned that in our last study. It was a visible symbol of God's presence and its occupation of the sanctuary was a testimony of God's gracious acceptance of the temple as his dwelling place. The dazzling brightness of the dense, portentous darkness of the cloud struck the minds of the priests as it had formerly done with Moses and they could not remain in the house. Now the same had happened with the tabernacle. The tabernacle was filled up with the cloud when the glory of Yahweh appeared there. Now, all of this speaks typically of the Levitical priesthood being displaced by one far greater that would exclude it from God's presence. God was accepting that, but he's saying, now I'm going to fill that with my glory and it will exclude those priests. So those 120 priests that were blowing with their trumpets were symbolically being excluded. Now, the trumpets, we you know what the trumpets were used for in Israel. They were used to call Israel together in drawing attention to new laws given by God. They were used for marching to war. And the sound of the trumpet was made with a long, plain blast. Then there would be one with breakings and quaverings. And then there'd be a long blast again. Now here in Acts, the 120 were being equipped to sound forth the alarm that a new dispensation had begun. And now Messiah had opened the way into the most holy by a new and living way. And in a way, these 120 gathered in the upper room were like those 120 priests. And they were sounding this new way. It would be a long blast of the trumpet. And at the commencement of the Acts, the gospel had been at long blast. The sounding out clearly, going into all the world and preach the gospel. He that believeth as it and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be condemned. So that was the, the, the initial long blast. But then for, since that time, the time of the Acts of the Apostles, there have been the, the breakings and the quaverings of that trumpet sound. It's been interrupted down through the Middle Ages and today the, the trumpet's not a clear sound. The, the, the sound of the call of God's gospel is going forth, but it's being broken in its quaverings and breakings. But there's going to be a very certain time in the very near future when it's going to sound again. Come with me to Revelation chapter 14 and verse 6, which we know quite well is the, the preaching of the gospel in the, uh, in the opening of the kingdom. Revelation 14 and verse 6. So the sounding of the trumpet is to bring the people's attention to the gospel, to, the, to, to God's intention with his, with his plan and purpose. And in Revelation chapter 14, verse 6, we read, And I saw another angel fly in the midst of the, this is the political heavens, having a not the, but an everlasting gospel. It's the gospel of the Ion. It's still a gospel concerning the things concerning the kingdom of God in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. But this gospel is going to go out to the nations with us, the saints, to preach unto them that dwell on the earth and to every nation and kindred and tongue and people, saying with a loud voice, fear God and give glory to him for the hour of his judgment is come and worship him that made heaven and earth and the sea and the fountains of waters. And of course, that occurs before Babylon falls. It occurs after Armageddon. The saints will go forward. The Aeonian gospel will be preached. So here's, here's a long, clear blast of the trumpet that's, that's quite clear. But back in Acts, the gospel also went forth clearly. But in the Middle Ages, it was just breaking and quavering, all as it happened under the law. The sounding of the trumpet, and Brother Thomas picks this up, the sounding of the trumpet, is 
is really in scripture speaking of preaching the truth have a look at this passage in isaiah 66 verse 18 In Isaiah 66, 18, we read the words, verse 17, or verse 16, For by fire and by sword will Yahweh plead with all flesh, and the slain of Yahweh shall be many. So now this is after the battle of Armageddon. It's the saints going forth. There will be the preaching of the truth. There will be the regathering of the nation of Israel that is still dispersed throughout the four corners of the earth. Verse 17, they that sanctify themselves and purify themselves in their gardens behind one tree in the midst eating swine's flesh and the abomination and the mouse shall be consumed together, saith Yahweh. So it's, it's talking about all the false religions, the apostasies, they shall be consumed by Yahweh. For I know their works and their thoughts it shall come that I will gather all nations and tongues and they shall come and see my glory. Then verse 19, and I will set a sign amongst them and I will send those that escape of them. Now those that escape of them are the, those of the, the Jews, the tribe of Judah. Some of them will escape. I will send those that escape of them, the Jews, to the nations, to Tarshish, to Pul, to Lud, that draw the bow. Now, if you look on the screen, Brother Thomas translates the draw the bow, that sound the truth. We can also connect that thought with the, the passage in the book of Revelation. You've got the, the first seal, the white horse, with a bow in his hand, but no arrow. And he's, he's drawing the bow, and he's, it's talking about the... the the victory of the word of God going forth in the first seal, being being sent with a bow, but preaching the truth. But here it's referred to in the translators have got drawing the bow, but Brother Thomas says, no, it's really the sounders of the truth. They shall go to these, these countries that, and they shall declare my glory amongst the Gentiles. So the truth will be taught, the Aeonian gospel, and the Jews that respond and accept Christ will be part of that, used in that part of that purpose. And it says, verse 20, and they shall bring all your brethren, the, all the Jews that are still in despair, all the, the, the 10 tribes of Israel, they shall bring all of your brethren for an offering unto Yahweh out of all nations, upon horses and in chariots and in litters and upon mules and upon swift feet to my holy mountain, Jerusalem, saith Yahweh, as the children of Israel bring an offering in a clean vessel under the house of Yahweh. So it's been a diversion, but I'm trying to make the point that the first century preaching of the gospel was equivalent to the sounding of the truth by those 120. And here we are living in the last days. And we're going to see it again. That trumpet will sound forth very clearly once again with a lot more, a lot more than the 120. But here they were with 120 in the upper room. And so now coming back to Acts chapter one, this 120, we're going to start a new work. And we're going to sound the truth out amongst the Gentiles. And so we read in verse 16, Peter says, Men and brethren, this scripture must needs have been fulfilled, which the Holy Spirit by the mouth of David spake before concerning, concerning Jesus, which was guide to them that took Jesus. So, that I've evidently spent the time now searching the scriptures to search what should be done. And in so Weymouth translation says of that verse, brethren, it was necessary that the scripture should be fulfilled. The prediction, I mean, which the Holy Spirit uttered by the lips of David about Judas, who acted as a guide to those who arrested Jesus. So now they are starting to see these passages that were in the Old Testament scriptures, in their law and their Psalms and their prophets, but were references to the work of Judas. It says, which the Holy Spirit by the mouth of David spake concerning Judas. So they could now correctly interpret the prophecies 
that were written by David. They could see that David's own experiences at the hands of his betrayers was typical of the circumstances that would befall his greatest son, the Lord Jesus Christ. For David spake concerning Judas, and we know those words, Psalm 41. And of course, David was referring to Ahithophel, his own familiar friend, who was a counsellor with him, but who joined the rebellion against him with his own son. And so he says, Yea, my own familiar friend in whom I had trusted, which had eaten my bread, he's lifted up his heel against me. And of course, those words were also said by the Lord Jesus Christ in John chapter 13, when he was speaking of Judas, he says, I speak not of you all, I know whom I have chosen, but that the scripture may be fulfilled, he that eateth bread with me hath lifted up his heel against me. And you can see what's happening with that language also. It's, it's Genesis 3.15 reversed. Because the Lord Jesus Christ was going to crush the serpent under his heel. But his, his serpent thinking lifting up its heel against the Lord Jesus Christ. And of course, Peter and, and the, the apostles could now see the Old Testament passages and they could say, yes, Judas really was a fulfillment of that. It wasn't just relating to David's circumstances. It was relating to Judas. And we can see that now in this passage of scripture. So it says that he, Judas was a guide to them that took Jesus. The word guide means he was a teacher or an instructor. He said, look, this is how he went to the, the priests. He told them, this is how we're going to uh, trap Jesus. This is what we're going to do. Judas was an instructor, not for the truth, but for the wicked men who took the Lord Jesus Christ. And so Judas fulfilled that role that Ahithophel played as the betrayer of David. Another passage from the Psalms. Behold, it was thou, a man mine equal, my guide and mine acquaintance. We took sweet counsel together and walked under the house of God in company. David talking about Ahithophel. But of course, that's what Judas did with the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, the Lord Jesus Christ would have known all along what was in Judas's heart. He would have known what the scriptures had said, but he let Judas go his own way. He gave him the opportunity to change and repent. And so now the apostles understood the true reason why Judas left the upper room early. They might have wondered why he went out of the room, but now they would understand he was the betrayer he went out and betrayed the Lord Jesus Christ. Now it says in verse 17 of Acts chapter 1, he was numbered with us and has obtained part of this ministry. So when it says he was numbered, that means he was chosen by the Lord originally. You might turn to that passage in Luke. He had the ability and he had the qualities of an apostle, but he was swayed by Jewish leaders. He listened to his own evil heart and his impulses and he was swayed by them. Judas was moved by personal ambition, greed and spite. He did not allow the instruction of the master to convert him as it did convert Peter. He was numbered with them. He had great privileges but he failed to utilize his opportunities and he represents those believers of all times who fail to resist the insidious influences of worldliness and who betray the Lord in so many different ways. And I've got that quotation there from Hebrews 10. Of how much sore punishment, suppose ye, shall he be thought worthy who hath trodden underfoot the Son of God and hath counted the blood of the covenant wherewith he was sanctified an unholy thing and hath done despite under the spirit of grace. It would be a terrible punishment if we treat our Lord the way that Judas did. And Judas will be raised and have to give an answer for what he has done. Now, as they, Peter said, he was numbered with us. Judas was included in the group who were promised thrones. They would promise that they would sit upon 12 thrones, ruling over the 12 tribes of Israel. He threw all of that away. And that promise of life and that promise of kingship, not over the 12 thrones of Israel, but kings and priests reigning with Christ has been offered to us. 
Now, it will only be given to us, we know, of course, if we remain faithful to that calling. When it says that he had obtained part of the ministry there in verse 17, part of this ministry, the word part means a lot or a portion or inheritance of this ministry, of this service. So the lot was a divinely governed method used by Moses to secure individual inheritance into the promised land. So he was to be given this lot. It means that the, the, the idea of the lot was, it was without man's choice. Two pebbles were used with one black stone and one white stone. But the, the, way, the outcome of the lot was entirely up to God. It was a divinely governed method. So he had, had been chosen that part, divinely chosen. And of course, the Lord Jesus Christ says, our future inheritance in immortality will be secured in much the same way. The way we have been treated, we've been given that lot, how we treat that. And of course, it says in Revelation, he that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the ecclesias. To him that overcometh will I give to eat of that hidden manna and will give him a white stone and in that stone a new name written which no man knoweth save he, saving he that receiveth it. And so it says verse 18 that this man, Judas, purchased a field with the reward of iniquity and falling headlong, he burst asunder in the midst and all of his bowels gushed out. Now, this is not a very pleasant verse, but because there is a, a parallel, or, or a, a contrast to what happened with the Lord Jesus Christ, we're just going to spend a couple of minutes looking at what it was saying. It says, he purchased a field. This man, Peter says, it's, a, it's a, an expression of disgust. The original Greek simply says, this. Peter was really repulsed by what Judas did. He purchased a field with the reward of iniquity. And this field wasn't purchased with 30 pieces of silver mentioned in Matthew 27, but it was really the process of theft from the collection bag. He was taking money out of the collection bag all the time. And Judas purchased this field with that money previous to, his cruci to the crucifixion of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, upon his death, it was acquired, required by the priest with the 30 pieces of silver returned by Judas as a cemetery for Gentiles. We're told that in Matthew. It says that in verse 18, that he purchased it with the reward of iniquity and falling headlong, he burst asunder. The Greek has head foremost. Matthew 27 tells us that Judas went out and he hanged himself. A terrible situation. But he went out and he hanged himself. He felt just that he couldn't be forgiven for what he had done. And these words seem to imply that he placed a rope about his neck and then leaning forward, put all the weight of his body upon his neck as it was tied to a tree. The limb of the tree broke and he fell headlong into the valley of Hinnom below the tree being on a cliff overlooking the valley. Now, we don't know, but that appears what to be what happened. When it says he burst asunder, the Greek word means to burst with a noise such as bones breaking beneath a blow. So as he fell, and it says in the passage there, that he fell headlong, not only was he hung, but all his bowels gushed out. A terrible thing. And it was fell in such a way that his intestines, his spleen poured out. That's what the word means. And he's, he lies in contrast to his, the Lord Jesus Christ, who poured out his soul unto death. But this man just poured out his body to a useless death. But the Lord Jesus Christ poured out his soul unto death in contrast. So Jesus' sacrifice led to joy in life while Judas's to ignominy, shame, and death. Now, it tells us there that the field was called Akeldama, that is to say, the field of blood or the place of blood. 
Now, these words have a double meaning. It has been brought with blood money and a witness to the blood of its owner, Judas. A terrible place. And so Peter goes on to say, coming more out of the Old Testament scriptures, for it is written in the book of Psalms, let his habitation be desolate and let no man dwell therein and his bishopric let another take. And Peter cites now from Psalm 69 concerning Judas, let their habitation be desolate and let none dwell in their tents and let another take his office in Psalm 109. Let his days be few and let another take his office or bishopric, his position. And so Peter discerns here there was one greater than David and one worse than Ahithophel. This prophecy really related to Judas. Let his habitation be desolate. This man's inheritance was to be a waste. It became a cemetery instead of a place for the provision of life. We've got to ask the question, will our life be a life of waste? Or will it be a life that will be beneficial? We need to consider what our actions are in the truth. That is bishopric, let another take. The word bishopric means episcop or overseer or office, as we've already seen. Let his days be few and his let his office, his position be taken by another. Judas had the opportunity to reach out great responsibilities and became a king over the tribe of Israel. And he threw that away. He destroyed his opportunity and he lost his future. His office was given to another. And it brings the question to us, how do we manage our opportunities and our stewardship in the truth? We have been called to be kings and we need to manage our life. And so in verse 21, we read these words. Wherefore of these men, which have accompanied with us at the time that the Lord Jesus went out, beginning from the baptism of John on at the same time he was taken up from us. Must one be ordained to be a witness with us of his resurrection? So Peter now moves on to the practical needs. He says, of these men that are here, the practical needs of the ecclesia, the number of the apostles must be complete, representing the 12 tribes the full family of God as required by the declaration in Matthew 19, that they would sit on 12 thrones ruling over the 12 tribes of Israel. The gap left was to be filled by one who was qualified to fill it. And the one chosen had to have been a personal witness to the teaching of Jesus, a personal witness to his resurrection and one who went in and out amongst them. So when they chose between those two, those men had to have that qualification to be an apostle. He must be ordained or one appointed to the position to be a witness. Now, the word witness is the word martyr. And we know what a martyr is, someone who is prepared to give their life. So they must be prepared. Peter was saying, Whoever takes this position must be prepared to witness even unto death. Theus says the word means those who after his example have proved the strength and genuineness of their faith in Christ by undergoing a violent death. We know Peter suffered a violent death. We know that John, that James did. And so they appointed two in verse 23. And they appointed two, Joseph called Barsippus, who was surnamed Justice, and Matthias. Joseph was called Barsippus. Joseph means adding or increasing. He was called Barsippus, son of summoning or calling. Perhaps called such, for he might have been active in preaching amongst the 70. Remember in Luke, they were, 70 were sent out and commissioned to go out and preach. He might have been with that group, he was surnamed Justice, which means the just one, perhaps because of his integrity, because he always was just in his judgments and decisions or his preaching concerning the principles of justification in the atoning work of the Lord Jesus Christ. So that was Joseph. But then there was Matthias. His name means gift or giver. And we, we don't know anything else 
about him. We've given a little bit of, of Joseph, but nothing about Matthias. And so Peter says, he says in verse 24, And they prayed and said, Thou, Lord, which knowest the hearts of all men, show whether of these two thou hast chosen. And in the original, original, the word men is not there. It's just thou which knowest the hearts of all. Of course, God knows the hearts of everybody. He is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of our hearts. He knows our thoughts before we know them. And so we need to be very, very careful what we allow our minds to, to dwell on and to think about because God knows. And Peter's making that point. God knows the hearts of all men. Solomon recognised that, that coming back once again to the consecration of the temple and Solomon's great prayer. And it was said of Solomon, and now Solomon, my son, when he was being answered by God, my knowing thou the God of thy fathers, and, and David, what David says to Solomon, his son, and thou Solomon, my son, know thou the God of my, thy father, and serve him with a perfect heart and with a willing, willing mind. For Yahweh searcheth all hearts and understandeth all the imaginations of the thoughts. If thou seek him, he will be found of thee. But if thou forsake him, he will cast thee off forever. But of course, David prayed that that would be his son, that his son would take that advice. And Solomon did for a while. But Solomon let his heart be carried away. So we need to watch our hearts. Happen to Solomon. That passage that says that God knows the heart of all, Bullinger says it can mean, really means the one who has insight through understanding. God understands what goes on. He knows what's going on in our hearts. At this point, the apostles would have been mindful that there had been one of their number who had appeared to be one of them. They, they thought Judas was just one of them. But it was revealed that he was a treacherous betrayer of the Lord. The Lord knew all the time what was in his heart. His brethren didn't. There's just a, a, listen, a little diversion on the heart of man. There's just been some interesting recent medical studies done on heart transplants. Apparently, now you know, when we say, the heart of man is desperately wicked or God knows the thoughts and intents of our heart. We generally say, well, that that's speaking about our mind. And it is. It, it is speaking about what goes on in our mind. But, but the medical profession has found that we can have emotions in our literal heart. Recent studies have shown that some heart transplant patients adopt the characteristics of their donors. So... A heart transplant recipient might receive the heart from somebody who's been a very gentle person. And when it's given to the recipient, they tend to develop those characteristics, an amazing thing. This is what the medical profession says. And so, as I said, we know that the reference to the heart of man in scripture is a reference to the mind, the thinking of the person. But it's interesting to think that the heart can store memory of our actual characters. And the scriptures uses that term, the heart of man. How wonderful is our creator and how wonderfully we have been made and how careful we must be to guard our hearts that it can also be part of our emotions and our responses can come from our literal heart as well as from our minds. Now I've got a little discussion here about how our minds and our hearts can be conditioned. I don't know whether any of you have heard, but I, I know that... Um, Phil, for example, is a teacher, so he would know about classical conditioning and uh, how Pavlov, who was a Russian psychologist, and you might be able to see on the screen there, I've got a man sitting there with a beard and a dog up in the right-hand corner of that little picture. Now, what this psychologist found, that every time he went to feed his dog, he noticed that his dog started to salivate. Then he said, well, Okay, the dog does this. If I turn on a light every time I start to feed the dog, 
will the dog salivate when it sees the light? And it did. It became, he, every time he fed the dog, he turned on a light. And when the dog, when the light was turned on, even without food, the dog would salivate. Then he found, well, if I ring a bell and I feed the dog, will the dog salivate when it hears a bell ringing? And it, it did. It was over a period of time, the dog was conditioned. So what, what it's teaching us, it's telling us that we can come, become conditioned to our environment. We can let things into our life that will shape our life, that can take us away from God, that will affect our heart. The world is conditioned by all sorts of things. We, let, we need to let ourselves to be conditioned by the word of God, by the principles of the truth. And that means constant exposure to the word of God, constant exposure to the things of the truth. If we're exposing ourselves to the things of the world, we're going to be conditioned by the things of the world and we'll respond to the things of the world. So it's called classical conditioning. So our hearts and our minds can be conditioned by the stimuli we present to them. And we know the scriptures say that the heart is desperately wicked. Who can know it? So we need to expose our hearts and we need to expose our minds to the word of God, to condition our minds to the word of God. And so that passage, when it says, they prayed to God, to the Lord, which knoweth the hearts of all men, it means a lot. God knows what's in our hearts and we've got to work on what does end up in our hearts, what we allow in through our eyes and through our ears that will condition our thinking. So the apostles had known nothing of Judas's true state of mind or evil intent. God had known men may carefully hide their true motives from their brethren, but they can't hide their motives from God. The apostles had learnt this lesson, and now they were prepared to leave the vital matter of selection of a suitable replacement in God's hands. So they said in verse 24, show clearly whither of these two thou hast chosen. They had become deeply aware of the need for the Father's guidance, so they leaned entirely upon his direction and judgment. And we need to do the same. We need to say, go to God in prayer, ask for Yahweh's direction in matters when it comes to decisions in life, major decisions. We need to make it a matter of prayer and go the way that Yahweh would want us to go if we know. So absolute trust in Yahweh and reliance upon him is an indispensable element in the life of every son and daughter of God, not relying on yourself, but waiting for the word of God to show us, God to show us which way to go. So we read in verse 25, that he may take the part, the one they chose, that he may take the part of this ministry and apostleship from which Judas by transgression fell, that he might go to his own place. The NAS, NASB translation says that Judas turned aside to go to his own place. That's what he wanted. He wanted money. He wanted property. God gave it to him. That's where he died. Jesus had appointed Judas a place to, in the original uh, arrangement, together with the other 11. Instead, instead Judas found another place entirely the grave and eternal condemnation. John says, whoever turneth aside and abideth not in the doctrine of Christ hath not God. So we've got to make up our mind which place we want to go to. And so, as I said before, they gave forth lots. And they left it entirely up to God. And, and the lot was used throughout scripture in a number of places for decisions that man was not prepared to make, leaving it up to Now, we don't do that today, but we can make decisions, a matter of prayer, and look for providential signs that God is giving us a direction in life. And so the proverb says, the lot is cast into the lap, that's the little stones, but the whole disposing thereof is of Yahweh. So the lot was a little pebble, as I said before, and was cast into the lap and either a black one or a white one would be taken out. And we've got some examples in scripture where it was used as the division of the land of Canaan amongst the, the tribes at the detection of Achan 
at the election of Saul to be king, at the distribution of priestly offices of the temple service, of the two goats at the Feast of Atonement, and here uh, were the choosing between Joseph and Matthias, who was numbered with the leaven. He was chosen by Lot. And so it says, when he was chosen, verse 26, and they gave forth lots, and the lot fell upon Matthias, and he was numbered with the 11 apostles. The word numbered means he was counted down in company, he was enrolled, he was voted in by God's hand. Matthias was accepted by the ecclesia for the position, and the full complement of the 12 could continue the work of the ministry. Note in scripture, after Matthias' appointment, there is no further record of any further successes to the apostles. Paul's called to office and he receives an appointment directly from the Lord Jesus Christ himself, but no other appointments are made. That's it. So Matthias was now appointed to this position. And now we have the 12. And of course, back in verse 13, it gave us the names of the twelve. It says there, and when they were called the, the eleven, and when they were come and went into an upper room where abode both Peter and James and John and Andrew and Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James the son of Alphaeus, and Simon Zelotes, and Judas the brother of James. These all continued with one accord, it says. But now you've got the twelve. And when you take the twelve and take the meanings of their names, you can uh, come up with a, a paraphrase of what they would be doing in the kingdom of God. Now, Brother Thomas doesn't do this with the 12 apostles, but he does do it with the 12 tribes of Israel, some of you may be aware, in Eureka, in a, in a very interesting way. So I've, I've used the same principle that Brother Thomas uses for the 12 tribes, and I've apply, applied it to the, the 12 uh, apostles here that were chosen. So we've got Peter, his name means a stone. John, his name means Yahweh is a gracious giver. James, he'll be taken by the heel. Andrew, manly. Philip, a lover of horses or the race. And Thomas, a twin. And when we put those six together, we come up with this paraphrase. They will reveal the stone that has been rejected, but restored by Yahweh, the gracious giver. To those who have been caught by the heel, by the man of our nature in the race between the twins, Jacob, spiritual Israel, and Esau, the world. The other six, Bartholomew, in his consolation, and Matthew, the gift of Yahweh. James Bar Alpheus, the heel kitcher, the son of changing. Simon the zealot, a zealous hearer. Judas of James, he shall be praised, and Matthias, the one finally chosen now, the gift of Yahweh. And when we paraphrase those six names, we have, but through the son of consolation, a gracious gift from Yahweh, the heel catchers will be changed by his son through a hearing with a burning zeal and praise him who is the gift of Yahweh. And I've put the two of those together which you'll get on your slides when I email these through that make up the complete sentence. A little paraphrase of the 12 who will be sitting on 12 thrones, ruling over the 12 tribes of Israel and bringing salvation to natural Israel, teaching them in the age to come. They will understand many things that they have learned in their days of mortality and will apply them as gracious kings in that age to come, ruling over the 12 tribes of Israel. And so that brings us to Acts chapter 2, but I think it's probably a good time just to finish here. And uh, God willing, next study, we will get into the very interesting section. We're not going to be able to get through Acts chapter 2, uh, but we'll just start to uh, make a break into Acts chapter 2, perhaps deal with the part of Joel's prophecy. So we'll look at the outpouring of the Holy Spirit in Jerusalem, verses 1 to 4 where they heard every man then speak in their own language, verses 5 through to 13, and the fulfilment of Joel's prophecy. We won't get time to deal with Peter's address, where he draws extensively 
from the Old Testament scriptures to prove that the Lord Jesus Christ is the Messiah. And we won't be able to deal with the conversion and growth in the Ecclesia. In those last verses, which are quite remarkable uh, for defining the role and establishment of basic principles, vital principles for the establishment of Ecclesias. So that's it for tonight, brothers and sisters. And I'm open for questions and discussion.